Strange as it may seem to Trekkies nowadays, there was a time before Star Trek. At some point, around, oh, 58 years ago, according to the date of the earliest pitch, Gene Roddenberry just made it all up. Well, okay, that's an oversimplification in a couple of ways. First, Gene Roddenberry didn't make it all up on his own, even before it became the decades-spanning multimedia franchise it is today. Star Trek was the product of the talents of many people other than Roddenberry himself. Writers, actors, producers, production designers, visual effects artists, and the list goes on and on. And second, Gene Roddenberry didn't just pluck Star Trek out of thin air. He was inspired by numerous works that came before. Some of these were works of science fiction, but some of the sources to which Star Trek owes the biggest debts are not science fiction at all. I'm going to examine a few of those sources of inspiration, sci-fi and otherwise, in this video as I attempt to answer the question, where did Star Trek actually come from? A good place to begin exploring this question is with that original pitch I mentioned a minute ago. Often referred to by its opening line, Star Trek is, and dated March 11, 1964, Roddenberry's pitch summarizes the series in the most basic terms, a sci-fi action-adventure series with regular lead and recurring characters, then presents log lines for some possible episodes, several of which were produced as episodes of the eventual series. Then, on page 3, Roddenberry writes, quote, or, to put it in a language of television, Star Trek is a wagon train concept, built around characters who travel to worlds similar to our own and meet the action-adventure drama which becomes our stories. That description led to the phrase, Wagon Train to the Stars, a summary of the show's high concept that has become as much a part of the idiom of Star Trek as Live Long and Prosper, He's Dead Jim, or beam me up Scotty, despite never actually being heard in an actual episode. I mean, technically no one ever said beam me up Scotty either, but they almost did. No Star Trek character ever even came close to saying wagon train to the stars. And why would they? It's just a weird thing to say in the course of a conversation. And Star Trek characters don't talk like that. They say normal things like check the circuit. Steady as she goes, and we can balance our engines into a controlled implosion. The kind of shit you probably overhear every day on the Metro. So what is Wagon Train, anyway? Well, gather round, youngsters, and I'll tell you the tale of an all-but-forgotten classic from the dying days of television's golden age. I don't know why I'm doing a Walter Brennan voice. That old racist wasn't in Wagon Train. He was starring in The Real McCoys at the time. The old racist who starred in Wagon Train was Ward Bond. Wagon Train is a classic Western TV series that ran for eight seasons from 1957 to 1965, first on NBC and then on ABC. It's about, and I know this will come as a shock, and for that I apologize, a wagon train traveling west from St. Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento, California in the years after the Civil War. Actually, it's about several wagon trains traveling from Missouri to California, because even by covered wagon, that ain't an eight-year trip. New season, new wagon train. Now, it's important to understand that the main reason Gene Roddenberry compared Star Trek to Wagon Train when he was pitching it to networks is that Wagon Train was a popular show with an easy-to-understand concept, and as a rule, network executives are clueless dum-dums with no imaginations who care only about money. Roddenberry used the example of Wagon Train to explain Star Trek to the networks in terms they could understand. Remember this show? This really popular and profitable show? My show will be like this show, only in space. But that is not to say Wagon Train and Star Trek don't share other things in common. In fact, on a conceptual level, they are actually very alike. Wagon Train is about a group of people on a long journey where, week to week, their ultimate destination isn't really the point. The show is about the places they visit and the people they meet along the way. 
The individual episodes are mostly islands unto themselves with very little in the way of long-term story arcs or character development. And while the stories rely heavily on guest stars and one-off characters, there are a few series regulars to tie everything together. Replace the wagon train with the Starship Enterprise and jump ahead a few hundred years and you'd wind up with something a lot like Star Trek. There's even a Captain Kirk type among the regulars, not the wagon master in this case, but the scout, Flint McCullough, played by Robert Horton, who was on the show for its first five seasons. Flint is relatively young, but experienced, easy on the eyes, affable, but also a man of action, always willing to fight for what he thinks is right. Granted, that's not so much a Captain Kirk type as it is an action-adventure show protagonist type, but it's a point in common between the two shows nevertheless. Another more concrete point in common? This guy. Gene Kuhn wrote 24 episodes of Wagon Train and went on to become arguably the most influential writer and producer on Star Trek. Besides writing classic episodes like Arena, Space Seed, and The Devil in the Dark, Kuhn also created the Klingons, came up with the idea of the Prime Directive, developed the comically antagonistic dynamic between Spock and Dr. McCoy, and significantly influenced the show's political point of view, especially when it came to human rights and opposition to war, themes he also explored in some of his Wagon Train episodes. There are differences, of course, apart from setting and genre, the Enterprise's mission to explore strange new worlds is fairly open-ended, whereas the wagon train is always on its way to California, not that it usually matters to the story of any given episode. The Captain Kirk type is not the lead, as I mentioned before. The lead of wagon train is the wagon master, basically the guy in charge of the wagon train. The original wagon master was Major Seth Adams, played by Ward Bond. He was replaced by Christopher Hale, played by John McIntyre, about two-thirds of the way through season four, when Ward Bond left the show following his death. And while Star Trek episodes nearly always revolve around the regulars, wagon train episodes frequently center on guest characters, with the regulars playing sometimes very minor supporting roles. The very first episode of Wagon Train ever broadcast, The Willie Moran Story, focuses on an alcoholic veteran and ex-boxer played by Ernest Borgnine, while the credited stars of the series have relatively little to do. Series lead Ward Bond doesn't do anything important until near the end of the episode, and second build Robert Horton is barely in the episode at all. This isn't unusual for a Western series from this era. Gunsmoke was the same way, basically an anthology show, except for the consistent setting and regular cast. But can you imagine an episode of Star Trek where Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and the rest of the regulars spend most of the show just kind of standing in the background while some guest character drives the story? It would feel like it belonged to a totally different series. Anyway, despite the dissimilarities between the two, Wagon Train is an important antecedent to Star Trek, but it's not the only one. To find another, all we have to do is take another look at that original pitch for the series by Gene Roddenberry. On page 5, Roddenberry begins offering brief descriptions of the principal characters. Most of these found their way, in some form or another, into the original pilot episode, The Cage, although Colt, the captain's yeoman, as described in the pitch, sounds more like the eventual character of Janice Rand than the version of Colt who appears in The Cage, and the navigator, or Tagus, gets a name and ethnicity change, becoming Tyler who, incidentally, is played by Peter Duryea, whose father, Dan Duryea, was a prolific character actor on film and television throughout the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and who appeared in several episodes of Wagon Train. Also, he was Al Denton in the classic Twilight Zone episode, Mr. Denton on Doomsday. How dry I am! How dry I am! Has nothing to do with Star Trek, I just can't help myself. Also, if you've been watching Star Trek Strange New Worlds, you've probably noticed that Captain Pike's helm officer on that show is named Ortegas, in a neat little nod to the original pitch. 
The most significant change among the principal characters from the original pitch to the screen is the captain, who in the pitch is identified as Robert April. By the time the cage went into production, the captain's name had changed to Christopher Pike, although the character description given to April in the pitch still fits. Capable of acting decisively and heroically, but also plagued by self-doubt and feeling isolated by command, that's definitely the version of Pike we see in the cage. His characterization in Strange New Worlds moves away from the self-doubt and isolation, as now he is instead haunted by his knowledge of his beep chair fate, but decisive, heroic, and let's not forget almost compulsively compassionate, that's our Chris. And of course, those last few qualities also apply to Captain Kirk, who becomes the lead protagonist of the actual series, as does this description from Roddenberry, still referring to his original concept for Captain April. A shorthand sketch might be a space-age Captain Horatio Hornblower, lean and capable both mentally and physically. The character of Horatio Hornblower and the novels by C.S. Forrester in which he appears are also often cited as important inspirations for Star Trek, so let's take a look at them. I can't justify doing an impression of a bigoted Hollywood legend this time, but fortunately, in 1951, Captain Hornblower was portrayed in a film by noted non-bigot Gregory Peck. And I would be very pleased indeed to perform for you my impersonation of Gregory Peck as I introduce the next segment of the video. Thank you. Captain Hornblower, like Captain Kirk, is both a man of action and a man of intellect. In most of Forrester's novels, he's depicted as being in his mid to late 30s or early 40s, old enough to be credible as a seasoned commander, but still young enough to be dashing. Despite being the commander of the ship, he personally leads landing parties, he's a cunning strategist with a strong sense of duty to the British Royal Navy in which he serves, but also a loyalty to those who serve under his command. Like the version of Pike we see in the cage and the Robert April described in the original Star Trek pitch, Hornblower is shown to struggle with feelings of insecurity and is detached from other characters, including his closest friends and family. Those aren't struggles we see Captain Kirk dealing with, at least not often enough that they become defining characteristics, but there's still a lot of Hornblower in Kirk. In fact, if you summarized Captain Kirk as a less neurotic Horatio Hornblower, you wouldn't be that far off. The plot summaries of some of the Hornblower novels sound like, with a few adjustments, they could easily be Star Trek episodes. In The Happy Return, the first novel in the series, originally published in the U.S. under the title Beat to Quarters, Captain Hornblower is sent to Nicaragua to supply arms to a powerful nobleman who is leading a rebellion against the Spanish. When he arrives, Hornblower finds that the nobleman is a violently ambitious warlord who believes himself to be a god. In Hornblower and the Atropos, Captain Hornblower commands the salvage operation of a British ship that sank with a precious cargo of gold and silver while fending off hostile Turks and dealing with a new midshipman who also happens to be a nephew of the king. In Flying Colors, Hornblower and two of his shipmates are captured by the enemy French, only to break free of their captors on the way to stand trial. They hide out on the estate of a sympathetic French nobleman, where Hornblower has an affair with the nobleman's daughter, before he and his men carry out a daring escape back to the British fleet. The Hornblower novels didn't just inspire Gene Roddenberry. Nicholas Meyer, director and co-writer of the two best Star Trek movies to feature the original cast, and arguably the two best Star Trek movies, period, Star Trek II and Star Trek VI, also cites Hornblower and Forrester as an influence. And it shows. One of my favorite things about Meyer's Star Trek films is that the ship feels like a ship. Close quarters, narrow corridors, lots of shots of the crew carrying out practical mechanical business, pulling up grates to load torpedoes and so forth. And the space battles, particularly the classic showdown between the Enterprise and the Reliant inside the nebula at the climax of Star Trek II, feel like naval battles and run on strategy and tension instead of breakneck action. 
So Wagon Train and the Horatio Hornblower books definitely inspired the creators of Star Trek and helped to shape it into what it eventually became. But there's one more precursor to Star Trek, one more very significant work that I think had an unmistakable influence on Star Trek. Unlike Wagon Train and Hornblower, this is actually a work of science fiction. It's a film from 1956, and if you've never seen it, you've almost certainly heard of it. I'm talking, of course, about Forbidden Planet. No, Forbidden Planet is the story of a group of space travelers on a mission to a remote and mysterious world in search of the survivors of another ship that disappeared many years before. If that sounds familiar, that might be because it's the same basic setup as the cage. The crew of United Planets cruiser C-57D, led by Commander Adams, played by Leslie Nielsen during his Surely I Can Be Serious phase, arrives at Planet Altair IV, hoping to discover what happened to the crew of the Bellerophon, a ship that vanished after setting off on an expedition here 20 years ago. Shortly after entering orbit around the planet, they are contacted from the surface by a man named Morbius, a member of the Bellerophon crew. And Morbius is like, hey, we're fine, everything's fine, we don't need anything, don't come down here. So naturally, Commander Adams is like, we're totally going down there. Morbius reluctantly gives them coordinates, and the C-57D lands on the surface of the planet, which appears to be a dry, desert world. Not long after they land, the crew is greeted by this guy, only the bestest, most awesome robot in the history of science fiction, Robbie the Robot. You're goddamn right. I don't care who your other favorite sci-fi robots are. If they ain't Robbie, they ain't worth a good goddamn. Who else is there? This guy, he doesn't even have a name. I know some of you right now are saying B9. That's his model number, not his name. Get lost. See what I did there? Fuck you. Robbie drives Commander Adams along with Doc and Lieutenant Farman to Morbius's house. Morbius greets them and invites them to lunch, which is synthesized by Robbie and is apparently absolutely delicious. Morbius is like, yeah, Robbie's pretty great. He can make anything you want. Just feed him a little bit of something and he can analyze and reproduce it. And that's not all. He can do pretty much anything. He's incredibly strong and he's totally obedient. Doc says, that's great, but um, couldn't he potentially become, you know, an unstoppable murder machine? And Morbius is like, not even. Watch this. And he borrows Adams's gun hands it to Robbie, and tells him to shoot Adams in the face. But Robbie just freezes. Electricity courses through his big old dome of a head. His inner gears start working overtime, but he can't move. Morbius is like, see? I murder-proofed him. Pretty cool, right? Robbie brings in some coffee. Morbius tells them what happened to the rest of the people aboard the Bellerophon. So what had happened was, within a year after we arrived here, everyone else was killed by a mysterious force that tore them limb from limb and destroyed our ship. So, yeah, that was weird. Also, my wife died, but that was unrelated. Morbius's daughter, Alta, walks in. Morbius introduces Adams, Farman, and Doc to Alta, and within a few seconds, Farman is like, Hey, sweet cheeks, give me a cup of coffee. Alta is only too happy to get some coffee for Farman, and Farman is only too happy to get that coffee, know what I'm saying? Morbius says, you'll have to forgive my daughter. She's never been around anyone other than me, so she's a little naive, but also groin-meltingly horny. Farman's like, sugar? And Alta's like, uh-huh, sure, hey, want to see me pet a tiger? And then she shows everyone how she can pet a tiger, because she has Dr. Doolittle powers. Morbius tries to rush the astronauts out, but Adam says before he leaves, he has to call Earth to see what he's supposed to do, because their orders didn't account for the possibility that everyone aboard the Bellerophon would be dead except for one weird guy, his smoking hot daughter, and the most awesome robot ever. What, did they plan this mission on the back of a Taco Bell receipt? How do you not account for that? The problem is, contacting Earth from this far away is simple in theory, but requires a bigger transmitter than the one they carry on the ship. They can build one with the equipment they have, but they'll need to remove the ship's engine in order to power it, and the whole process will take at least 10 days. 
Morbius doesn't like the sound of that. So he says, how about if I get Robbie to help you and then maybe you can get the fuck out of here by like day after tomorrow? Adams is like, okay. The next morning, Robbie shows up carrying 10 tons of lead shielding with one arm like the motherfucking boss he is. And Alta has tagged along too. While the rest of the crew is working on the transmitter and horsing around with a giant magnet giving us this cool special effect, Alta and Farman sneak off to see if her animal controlling powers work on one-eyed snakes. Meanwhile, Cookie, he's the ship's cook, don't you know? If there was a drug dealer on the ship, what would they call him? Dopey? Anyway, Cookie pulls Robbie aside and hits him up for some booze because he's down to his last swig of bourbon and he needs some more to cook with, you understand? So, Robbie grabs Cookie's bottle and drinks the rest of it because he's so baller. Then he analyzes it and says, Yeah, I should be able to synthesize some more for you. How 60 gallons sound? Remind me how much booze C-3PO synthesized for Luke Skywalker? Was it that amount? Or was it... Was it no amount? I thought so. Ooh, I speak a bunch of languages. Eat shit. Cut to Adams walking up on Farman and a very unimpressed Alta making out in the woods. Adams looks at Farman like, get back to work, Lieutenant. How dare you neglect your duties to take advantage of this pure, innocent, unsuspecting girl. Then he turns to Alta like, and you, you shameless slut, look how you're dressed. What did you expect was going to happen? I've got a ship full of fuck-happy astronauts. They set eyes on a ripe tomato like you, and they go out of their heads with lust. Go home and change clothes. Put on something that covers up those long legs with those soft, creamy thighs. Oh my god, now you've got me doing it. That night, something invisible sneaks aboard the ship and wrecks some equipment. Nobody knows what happened. So the next day, Adams and Doc visit Morbius to see if he knows what the hell's going on. After Adams catches Alta taking a skinny dip and indulges in a little light sucking of face with her after she towels off and gets dressed, Adams and Doc enter Morbius's secret study. Morbius isn't there at first, but pretty soon he shows up, coming from a secret room behind his study. Adams informs Morbius about what happened on the ship last night, and Morbius tells him about the Krell, the technologically advanced aliens who once lived on this planet, only to vanish suddenly eons ago on the cusp of their greatest achievement. Morbius takes Adams and Doc into his secret room, which is actually an underground Krell facility, and shows off some of the equipment, including a machine the Krell used to educate their children, which can measure the user's intelligence and also, with practice, project a physical manifestation of something from the user's thoughts. Only, he warns Adams and Doc not to try it, because the captain of the Bellerophon tried it back in the day, and it killed him instantly. And the first time Morbius himself tried it, it knocked him out for like a day. Although, he was twice as smart when he woke up. So there's that. Morbius tells them about what he's discovered about the destruction of the Krell, how they had been working, united, on a project that they hoped would allow them to transcend the need for physical instruments of any kind. But whatever, that's probably not important now. Hey, want to see some more? It turns out the entire planet is a giant machine, constantly carrying out operations, repairing itself, generating power for some now-forgotten purpose. Anyway, yada yada yada, the invisible creature attacks the ship again, killing a member of the crew this time. Morbius is like, this is what happened to the crew of the Bellerophon 20 years ago, and I have a feeling it's only gonna get worse if you stay, so you all should definitely leave. But Adams is like, nah, we're gonna stay. The creature attacks again, gets caught in a force field they've erected around their encampment, but that doesn't really seem to hurt it. Two crewmen get too close to the creature, and they get killed, and then Farman, that shithead, charges in, and he gets killed too. Well, at least something good came out of all this. Meanwhile, back at the old Morbius place, Morbius wakes up from a nap. As soon as he does, the creature attacking the crew disappears. Well, gee, that's funny. Wonder if those two events are related in any way. Adams is like, okay, screw this, we're leaving. He and Dot go to Morbius's place to evacuate Morbius and Alta, but Robbie meets them at the door and refuses to let them in. 
They draw on Robbie, doofuses that they are, and Robbie disables their guns with a simple blast of his mighty headbeams. Alta shows up and tells Robbie to let them in. While Adams and Alta talk, Doc sneaks into the Krell lab and takes a turn on the educator machine, hoping to learn enough to ensure that they, unlike the crew of the Bellerophon, will be able to successfully escape the planet. Doesn't go so well for Doc. A few minutes later, here comes Robbie, carrying Doc out of the Krell facility. Robbie puts him down on the couch, and Doc says to Adams, Okay, so I took the brain boost, and I'm super smart now, and I think I figured out what's going on. That big experiment the Krell were working on when they all disappeared? It worked. But there was only one problem. It unleashed monsters from the id. Adam says, monsters from the id? What do you mean? But Doc's like, can't talk, dead now. Morbius walks in, and he's a jerk about Doc being dead, so Alt is like, you're a jerk. I'm leaving with the hunky astronauts. Adams asks Morbius what the id is, because I guess basic psychology wasn't part of his astronaut training, and also a bunch of us dipshits in the audience might need it explained, I guess. And Morbius says, it's like the subconscious mind. You know, instinct and impulsive emotions and desires and shit. Now Adams knows what's going on. He lays it out for Morbius and us. The Krell built all that machinery to allow them to project their thoughts into reality, to create without the need for physical instruments. All they had to do was imagine what they wanted and where they wanted it, and it would be created. There's just one problem. They forgot about the subconscious. The machinery they built to manifest their conscious desires also brought their unconscious desires to life, manifested as the invisible beast that's been wrecking shit and murdering people the last few days. Such beasts must have killed the Krell, destroyed their entire civilization. And now, whether he wants to believe it or not, and he doesn't, Morbius himself is the source of the monster that's been attacking the astronauts lately. That's why only he and Alta have been safe. But now, uh-oh, Robbie detects the monster approaching the house. Morbius tells Robbie to kill it, but Robbie locks up like he did when Morbius ordered him to shoot Adams earlier because Robbie knows the monster is part of Morbius, and he's programmed not to harm people. Robbie is such a smart robot. The monster gets into the house, and they run to the Krell facility and take shelter in the lab behind an impenetrable Krell door. Adams tells Morbius that, thanks to using the Krell education machine, his mind is the only one strong enough to operate the Krell machinery. Twenty years ago, he must have unknowingly sent his id monster out to kill the rest of the Bellerophon crew when they decided to return to Earth and Morbius wanted to remain. Then, when Morbius felt threatened by the arrival of the astronauts, the id monster returned. Morbius still refuses to believe that he is responsible, but then the id monster melts through the impenetrable door and enters the lab. And Morbius is like, okay, so I might be partially responsible. Overcome with guilt and grief, he stands and throws himself in the path of the monster, which kills him and then seems to disappear itself. Moments before he dies, Morbius instructs Adams to activate the self-destruct mechanism of the Great Krell machine, telling him he has 24 hours before the planet explodes and that he must be a hundred million miles away by then. The next day, Alta is with the surviving astronauts on the ship, along with Robbie, who has joined the crew as the new navigator. If not for the obedience programming, he'd be running that ship inside of a week. They're past the 100 million mile perimeter, and Alta and Adams watch as Altair IV explodes in a brilliant burst of light. Adams comforts Alta by telling her that someday, in about a million years, humanity will have reached the level of the Krell, and then her father's name will be remembered once again to remind us that we are not gods. And Alta's like, Thanks. A lost expedition. A mysterious planet populated only by a weirdo scientist, his beautiful daughter, with whom the lead protagonist has a romance, and their robot, immensely powerful alien technology, and a dark, deadly secret that threatens the heroes and kills a bunch of background characters, plus a whole bunch of Shakespearean parallels? Tell me that's not a Star Trek episode. Even some of the character types are the same. The serious yet gallant commander? His friend and confidant, the ship's doctor? 
the drunk? And most importantly, Forbidden Planet and Star Trek share the same essence. They are fundamentally similar works, pulpy, goofy sci-fi adventure stories, mostly played straight, with an underlying moral, with something to say beyond, look at this neat robot. Although in this case, that may have been sufficient. Those are the three antecedents of Star Trek that I wanted to talk about. There are others, of course, many, many others. There are works that influenced and informed Star Trek as a whole, particular Star Trek series, and individual episodes. Star Trek The Motion Picture feels patterned after 2001 A Space Odyssey in terms of its tone, basic plot, and, shall we say, unhurried pace. The entire franchise, but particularly TNG, is waist-deep in references and allusions and parallels to Shakespeare. Star Trek Voyager shares more than a little DNA with Lost in Space, though unfortunately not the genes that code for a fun and entertaining show. Aside from the Hornblower novels, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan is also evocative of works such as Moby Dick, the novels of Jules Verne, and submarine films like Run Silent, Run Deep. The newer shows currently in production continue this practice. The interactions between Captain Burnham and her crew and Species 10C at the end of Star Trek Discovery's fourth season are obviously inspired by Arrival, the brilliant 2016 film directed by Denise Villanueva and starring Amy Adams. The sixth episode of the first season of Star Trek Strange New Worlds, which debuted less than a week ago as this video is being released, is strongly influenced by the classic Ursula Le Guin short story, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. None of this is a bad thing. There's an old saying which tells us that good artists borrow while great artists steal. That's only half serious, but there is some truth to it. There are only so many plots. So many character types, so many points to be made. Creativity and originality are important, but so is execution. Having a story with some familiar beats is fine, as long as you hit those beats just right, just when you need to. And more often than not, that's what Star Trek does. Sure, it's possible to go overboard, to move past drawing influence from something to ripping it off, but honestly, the thing that Star Trek has ripped off the most is itself with mixed results. Maybe they should just stick to Shakespeare. You're goddamn right. Now do Henry V. With Robbie the Robot. Excellent. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm going to let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is going to be, but before I do that, I want to give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Kirsten Beyer. That's right. That's who you're dealing with here. Thank you, Kirsten. Estra Filario DC, thank you Estra Filario. Joe Heggy III, thank you Joe. Patrick McRae, thank you Patrick. Josh Nathan, thank you Josh. Chad Smalley, thank you Chad. Beth Deberton, thank you Beth. Next, new channel members, and there's only one this time, Lane Foster, thank you Lane. Those are the newest Patreon patrons to pledge $5 a month or more, and the newest channel members to join at the 5 bucks a month tier or higher. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash steveshives or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics, and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice-monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon, or become a member at the 5 bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout-out at the end of a Trek Actually video. If you'd rather give a one-time gift than a recurring monthly contribution, you're always more than welcome to do that by clicking the thanks button right below the video or via PayPal or Venmo. The links for those are in the video description. Many thanks. 
If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects, The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole, and Trek Reluctantly, the watch along stream Dana and I do every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. As always, links in the description. And now, to next month's regulation Trek Actually topic. A couple of weeks ago, I released a video to mark the occasion of 40 years since the premiere of Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, talking about what the creators of the current generation of Star Trek series and films could learn from it. We're going to do a similar exercise next month, only instead of Star Trek II, the subject will be another of the most important and beloved projects in the franchise, the series that brought Star Trek back to TV after 20 years and set the tone for the next 20. Next month's video will be an exploration of the question, what can the creators of new Star Trek actually learn from TNG? That's going to be a good one. See you then. Thanks for watching and take care, everybody.